get into the school, the Pleasant Hill School. They call it uh, Pleasant Hill School, and there wasn't wasn't anything about it being pleasant. <laughs> Not anything. But Pleasant Hill wasn't any different than any other school in the area. It was all about the same. There was no out, no no uh, hot, no water in the building, no electricity, no thing they had, but the schoolhouse and uh, the out, out and the outhouses and a and coal shed. That's what uh, the Pleasant Hill School. Now Pleasant Hill School, just about before the traffic ha happened. There was only one schoolhouse here. Now this schoolhouse here, a year earlier, sat down here in this area here, which that would have made that about three miles. Now this this is this is not scaled, but it's to figure about one section. So you had about one, two, three miles. So this schoolhouse, but later on, about a year before the tragic, they had moved that schoolhouse up here with and made two because they had so many kids in it. And uh, there was uh, eight kids lived west of the, of the school. There was eight kids, or there was a different bus driver that picked them up over there. And on the east side, there was 20 kids over here. So I made 28 kids. And this school here was of grade one, grade six, and this one was seventh, eighth grade here. Now the school bus, uh, Mr. Miller, the driver, he lived here. He had a 1929 Chevy farm truck. And it had a grain bed on it. And he removed the grain bed off this old truck here. And he purchases this old uh, shell, bus shell. It had been jumped out and was been used no more. And he bought that there and he mounted that on on this chuck frame and chassis here. And in the summertime he would when school's out, he would take this bus, this uh, bus off and put the grain bed back on <laughs> and use uh, it in the harvest. The older buses, which I recall riding on my first year of school, riding in a bus, looked just like this. And those buses, they were a little modern. They had uh, seats running down. Oh, I got this fixed up. But anyway, there's, they had uh, seats running down each side, back and down like this, and one down through the middle. And the seats had padding on them. And, uh, and would, the heat from the radiator, not radiator, but the engine and, and the heater, would go down that center aisle, and that's what heated the bus up. But that bus over there, all there was is just a, a 2 by 12 plank running down the side on both sides no heater nothing and this window was broke out in the back here and later on in all the confusion this window got broke out but anyway Mr. Miller uh, whenever he would he had to haul all the water, he'd take water to get at his house and every morning he would fill, he had to carry the cream can on the side of the bus and that's what he called hauled water to school in. I call this uh, where, when and why it happened. And I don't like going to any detailed of uh, really what those kids, I mean, nobody knows exactly. Nobody knows. 
And when I put this all together, like I said, I read every book, every article that you could find. And uh, the more I read, the more confused I got. But there's one other book that came out a little later on at the, at the Colorado uh, Historical Society interviewed some of the, of the survivors and they told the story. And the story that they told was nothing like the other. Now, but don't get me wrong, I have nothing wrong with the newspapers, nothing wrong with all that radios. But a lot of the articles make no sense. Now, you can't blame the newspaper, this and that, for that, or the radio, or whatever. But if they'd asked somebody, and there's so many people had stories, they knew all about it. So they would tell them, and half the time it wouldn't even be right. So, but they'd go ahead and print it. So I never did take anything, what I'm doing here, from the newspaper, or any place else, or any little article book. I kind of stuck with this one book. Then a little later on, 60 years later, they had a uh, reunion and two of the ladies, it was the only one would say it would give a, a, any, any talk off. There were a lot of them, they didn't want to talk about it. And there was a lot of people there, the outsiders, like the neighbors and people on the street, on the circuit and all that stuff, and they did a little talking. But uh, this one lady, <coughs> Rosemary Cannon, I don't like to mention names because God bless them. But she said uh, there's a lot of things that she remembered, faintly remembered, but then there were some of the others that said they, they didn't remember, they don't recall. And the same with some of the others, they said they remember things and, and she didn't recall. But anyway, in this presentation, that's what I'm using, is, is words from them or what, what they said. And as far as the bus driver go, his wife was there. And when I speak of the bus driver, I'm speaking of is what he told her the morning when he left. And same way on the bus, there was, uh, there was three girls. And they're right here. Anyway, uh, anyway, turn to three out three of the older ones. And there's uh, the one that auntie boy. They sat right beside, right behind the bus driver, and he would, would talk to them. And, and what he told them, and, and that when what they said, and that's what I'm using all what the bus driver said in the bus, because nobody knows what really went on in there. On March the 26th, 1931. 17 miles north. Let me get over here while you make it. 17 miles north of Holly and 14 miles south of Towner. Of course, then you had to come back around over in here to get to the school. So that was the distance here, unless you cut across the country like this. But Mr. Miller, <coughs> this is where he lived at. And he kept this bus. This bus looked like this. He parked it right here, right by the window. Well, Mr. Miller got up that morning, about seven o'clock. He walked out on his porch, and looked up, <coughs> and he told his wife, he says, "You know, I, I can't believe the way that sun." It's coming up and how dark and cloudy and dirty looking it is. He said, I've never seen looking like that before. So he, he kind of passed it on, went on back in, grabbed his coat, walked back out, picked up his bus, drove it up there, filled the water can up. Then he took off to pick up his kids, the trip. He started down here at the Brown family. Now right here, it, it, this is Colorado 
And this is Kansas. This is your state line. There were three families lived in Kansas, and Kansas would pay Howard County for the kids could go to school over here. But Mr. Miller, he drove down there and he picked up the brown kids. He pulled in. Just as he pulled in, there were three of them, Rosemary and the little one, the little brown boy. He was starting out to do his chores, and he had a slop bucket in his hands. He seen the bus coming, throw the slop bucket down. He had his coat, and let's pail sitting there by the fence. He seen the bus, and he sold the uh, uh, strap up and down, and grabbed the little light sweater they had with him, and left his lunch. Pails sitting right there, and jumped on the bus. The bus driver went off and picked, picked up six kids from the hot flicker's place. Six kids there. Now one of the girls, Mrs. Hoffler, she was always on this kid, dressed warm when you go to school. And she always been to wear overshoes. Now they did have just a little bit of snow uh, just a couple, three days before that. But just by one of one the girls, she didn't want to wear overshoes. She just wanted to use her slippers. And her mother and sister, you wear those overshoes. I remember what I'm saying about these over, that's overshoes. So I picked up these six. Then dropped over here and picked up two the Frost kids. Picked them up. They went right on up here, stopped, picked up the stone breaker. Two girls. Now this oldest stone breaker girl, she had just had a birthday. And she got a light sweater for, for, for her birthday. And she wanted to wear that sweater to school. Her mother said, no, it's too light. He said, you wear it later on. Anyway, they argued back and forth. And I always like to tell this here. Especially when I have some youngsters. I don't care how your folks, you think they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> if you don't agree with them, listen to them. Listen. As a rule, they know what they're talking about. You'll, you'll understand one day what I'm saying. But anyway, she finally won out and her mother let her wear Sweater. Now keep that sweater in mind. The bus left there, went up, picked up the little Johnson boy. He came out and all he had on just a light sweat light jacket. Picked up and just went by and he stopped at his house and he picked up his daughter, Mary. She was about six years old. And from there he went up and picked up four unpeople kids. Now at the time, Mary Smith, folks lived here. Well, they had just bought a place in the old by Hartman, and it was in the process of moving, so Claire was staying with the unpeeds. So that would make five that he picked up there. Then the road came around here. Now right here, is what they call the prairie road. It's a the diagonal road. It's just kind of more just a trail, or whatever, running across here, and, and I wish it cut off quite a bit more. But anyway, but this was the bus route, so he went on around here. Well, he pulled into the schoolhouse here. Now keep in mind about this prairie road in the school. When he pulled into the school here, the two teachers, Mrs. Mosier, Mr. Frieden, the school, a band teacher, they was out there in the yard talking and looking at this weather. And they didn't really know what to do. And uh, Mr. Miller said, I think we're going to just leave the kids here. No, they said, let's send them home. Send the kids home. By that time, this storm 
and started moving in. Now sometimes, you old timers will probably re agree with me, back in those days, even sometimes a storm will move in just, just like that. And the reason you'll have, and the reason I know like if I was raised up in the North Country, you may get a storm, snow, well, I mean, just like snow, and then you may get six inches, whatever. Then you may get what they call a, a storm, another wind blowing, and the wind would blow, and you'd you know, blow and sort of move the snow and blow and whatever, but yet you could still see. <laughs> but this was an old, one of those old northerns that came in, just like that. When it came in from the northwest, he right down across through the rattle through right into Colorado and right, kept right on going. And at the same time, there's other, uh, I'll get that a little later. <laughs> but anyway, the school teachers said, well, they want to send them home. They said, send the kid, Mr. Miller, and all this, don't. But finally, the teacher won out. So they loaded the kids back on the bus and sitting there, and Mr. Miller, Told one of the other girls, she said, told her, he said, when you leave here, we're going to take the diagonal road across it and get up there and that's where we're going to stop at. You go, <laughs> wait, wait up. But by the time they got out of this driveway, the snow is going so hard, hitting something cold, uh, you, the kids in this book, they couldn't even see the schoolhouse. It was snowing that hard. And the bus driver kept on going and pretty he got where he couldn't even see. He rolled out his window and uh, had to uh, roll it back up because the wind was blowing so hard and hitting him in the face. Okay. Now right here, one little gal said, mentioned him in the interview, she said she could not believe that any adult that was in charge of children would make a decision and send kids off in the bus in a storm like this. And the bus, she said, wasn't even fit for cattle. It was that bad. The snow had started coming in this window. Started blowing in on this window. And he had a cardboard stuck in here. Okay. From here on out, I want you to be in those kids' feet, in their shoes, in that bus. When Mr. Motor he's going to take that diagonal road. And he thought he was on it. And first he got rough and he could go. And what he had done, he thought he made the turn to go, but he made a wrong turn, made more turn to the right. And that put him out in this pasture. And he was just going around and around in the circles. And meanwhile, the kids, they was all singing, happy, because they got out of school. <laughs> but some of went to, Mr. Miller, this uh, cardboard will not stay in the window, so he would stop. He put the cardboard in, finally it got so wet, but anyway, they'd go a ways, and the bus would die on them, stop. So he finally worked on it, he'd get it, get it started. And this went on, and, and uh, it just kept going around and around, and all of a sudden, Mr. Miller said, I don't know where we're at. He said, well, you should have seen a fence line, or a windmill, or something by then, where we're at. They went just a little farther, and all of a sudden, everything came to a halt. And all the kids were just, just quiet. There was no sound up. And, it, and what happened, they had hit the Holly and Towner Road. And the bus hit that bar pit, and got done, and, and they wouldn't, and it got stuck, and, and, and the engine quit on them. But Mr. Miller sat there, and, he says, I don't know where we're at. And, and between, before that, 
Mr. Miller couldn't even see the radiator cap on the bus. When they came to the sudden halt, Mr. Miller looked out the windows and tried to see, he couldn't see nothing. It's snowing so hard. And he opened up the door and went outside and he came right back in. He said, you can't even see the end of your hand. It's snowing that hard. So he knew they was in trouble. And the three older girls and that boy, they said something was wrong in it too. But anyway, they, they tried to start the bus again and it couldn't start, wouldn't start, wouldn't start. So finally, Mr. Miller and the auntie boy, the auntie boy took the crank, got out, put the crank in, and then he would crank, turn the crank on the, on the bus, Mr. Miller was run the starter. Well, it wouldn't start. We come find out later on, the bus was just packed full of snow. The wire it was all wet and whatever it was done. <clears throat> so they sat there, and the longer they sat there, the colder it got and colder it got. And finally, he, that, uh, him and uh, the empty boy got out again, and they started out. They go see if they could find out where they're at. And he said he, he could tell they was on, on the grade. They were just, just struck. And it was very, very seldom uh, drove on. It's about the only time we ever used it is in, in the summertime with farmers used that go from Hotford to Holly or town or whatever. But very, very little traffic on it. And they said, well, maybe somebody will come by pretty soon and pick it up, pick us up. Find us. But anyway, that never did happen. But they would go out every now and then and try to see what she was at. And they'd have to turn around and come back and come back and closer, we'd be froze. But Mr. Miller told all the kids, he's, now this here uh, seats in there, he was just sitting And he took the seats and pulled them up, not just pulled them, but picked them up. And the kids had their lunch pails sitting down under here, or sacks, whatever they had. A lot, a lot of these used large buckets. For, for the lunch pail. But anyway, he told him, he said, no, we're going to be here for a while, and I want everybody to keep them moving, and don't go to sleep, because that's all it will take. But anyway, all that afternoon, so what can you do in a bus only seven foot wide and ten foot long, and twenty kids? Now what, what what can you do? But he made main thing to keep a moving. But as the day went on, and they kept getting colder, and the snow kept blowing in. So finally they said, "Well, they'll build a fire." Well, what are we going to build a fire in? The best we will have to think of the of the crane can sitting there with the water in it. He had built a bracket here to set that can in. So he got the crank out, he got outside and he tore that wood off of there, and he took the lid off the cream can, threw it here, the inside. Now this is what the bus was looking like with the snow coming in these windows. And you imagine these kids in here too. So they got this wood and they stuck it down the gas tank and get enough gas to get the wood started. And they put it in his uh, cream panel lid and put some paper in and they got the burning and they got so smoky that they couldn't stand it so they had to put off the fire. I mean they couldn't stand it. So there they were. So anyway they made it through the night. Every so often Mr. Miller walk, uh, holler at them, call them by name. And I told the bigger kids to take the little ones and keep them as close as he can so he gets some body heat water that'll help. But do not let them go to sleep. He'd holler at them, then he'd get them up and make them jump up and down. Now that's how this window got broke out here, is in there with the jumping up and down exercise. And one of the boys 
uh, fell into this window and broke this one down. So now you, you had a draft from this window all the way through the bus. And it's colder than ever. On the little gal that bought the horseshoes, she had these slippers, and she kept taking the horseshoes off, and, and her feet was starting to swell. And uh, she pulled her slippers off, and then she would try to put them back, but she couldn't get her slippers back on. Her feet had swelled so much from the frost water. So she just took the shoes off and put the older shoes on, and that's the only thing she had to, to uh, protect her feet. Well, anyway, they had made it through the night. It's a miracle why how they made it, but they made it. At Seven o'clock the next morning. Well, that was the on Friday, and then Holly. It was 20 below zero, and the wind was 75 miles an hour, and it had to be the same thing right there. About uh, 9 o'clock, one girl looked at, seen this uh, Louise Stonebreaker. She was sitting in back, but she didn't, wouldn't have nothing to do with nobody. And they couldn't talk to her, they couldn't get her to do anything. Finally, they realized that she had passed away. Now, she's the little gal had that, that sweater, that little white sweater. A little later on, Clara Smith, well, no, uh, not, yeah. Well, Bobby Brown, he was sitting on his sister's lap all night and night when she kept trying to keep him warm between him and his, his little sister. But she noticed his eyes was getting blurry and uh, they finally got him up to do exercise and he said, I'm fine, he said, I'm getting warm. He started taking his coat off, his light off. He said, I'm done fine, ain't nothing wrong with me. And he was standing up, and all of a sudden he just collapsed and went down. So they picked him up, and they put him here in the back, in the snow, along with this other little gal. So I made two of them back there. A little later on, about 11, about, uh, 11 o'clock, whatever, not about 11, but about 12 o'clock. Clara Smith seen this fellow, Kenneth Johnson. He was standing up there and he was good place the first person. He just, he collapsed. He was, he said he was warm and he didn't want nobody to mess with him. You know, and he passed away. But he had fell down to the, on the floor and Clara seen it. And to pay much attention, but she noticed the other kids was crumping on him. So she finally got mustered up enough. Well, what do you want to say? Got him picked up and moved back to where the other three. Now this little uh, brown girl was sitting on her sister's lap. She says, uh, "I've got to go to the bathroom." Rosemary told her, she said, what? you can't go outside. But they've been using back in the snow for, for the bathroom. And that's where it that was. Of course, when you're cold like that, you think you've got to urinate, whatever. And that cold, it just affects your mind, whatever. But anyway, About, about five, about three o'clock. Anyway, but Mr. Untina, he'd been worrying all along. He was the gentleman that lived up here and had to fight. And he kept telling his wife, the kids got to be at the school. But his hands was tied. 
he, was, he couldn't even see anything. There was no sense getting out in it. But about two o'clock, one through whatever, the weather had started to lift them just enough where he could see a little bit. And he told his wife, he said, I'm going to school. He went out and he harnessed up his team, horses. I put some sacks over their nose. And I've had people ask, well, oh, why did he put the sacks over those horses' nose? <clears throat> An animal does not breathe through the mouth like a human being. They just do not. And that, and that snow or dirt and stuff will go up in the nostrils and a whole animal and that's why that's the reason they smother. Now that's why the sacks they put up over their nose and will keep that snow from blowing and sucking up into the horse's nose. But anyway, Mrs. Auntie, she fixed up some blankets and some lunch and stuff and she put it in the wagon and he, and he took off and he fought he could follow that uh, a little path a road down through there just enough and he knew if he'd got lost his horses would bring him home and they will and I don't know we'll go we'll take him home you can count on that but he made it to the school and he got there and this one teacher Mr. Freeman he had stayed there after they all left for just a little while, and he said he'd take off. Anyway, he got just around this curve here, and he got stuck, and he had to stay in the schoolhouse. But now these, other, these other eight kids, they had made it to driver, Oscar Kleiner was the other school bus driver, and he had a car that he picked up the eight kids, and they had made it to a farmhouse just not too far from the school. That's where they hung up at. But anyway, she said they, they almost ate them out of the house and home. Anyway, they run out of car, uh, coal. And after the storm had lifted just a little bit, they had went up to the schoolhouse and picked up some coal from school. Then the school teacher went back home with them. But when Mr. Auntie got there, there was nobody in there. And uh, oh, the inside the schoolhouse, we're talking about how the, the one whole corner was just packed with snow. That snow had drifted in through the windows, just like dust, dirt. So he took off. Meanwhile, Mr. Uh, Stonebreaker, he had uh, took off with, on a saddle horse. And he finally met up with uh, Mr. Unty along the road there, and they discussed it. But anyway, the kids, the bus driver had left shortly after seven. He said, I've got to go for help. So, and earlier on, when him and this uh, Unty boy was up, Unty boy got so cold and wet, and Mr. Miller gave gave him his sheep lined coat get warm in. And the boy, he, that's what he slept in that coat all night. And Mr. Hunt Miller had just his shirt on. He, he put up. And they said that Mr. Miller was a wonderful man. And he sure didn't know what happened back right there. But anyway, a couple of girls thought they could hear something. They looked out the window, that finally stepped outside, and they thought they'd seen a car. So I walked out and presented that they couldn't see it anymore. And there was a car down there. It was right there. Uh, 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 that Reiner, his niece, his nephew had come in earlier and they had got stranded on the road just before they turned down the road to Reiner. And he had followed that fence line down to the house and that was the car that they thought they see. seen. And there was a car. So they went back and virtually well they took another door. They could they could see the schoolhouse then. So they got out to it and they couldn't find it. They couldn't see the schoolhouse. By then, without having anything to eat, they tried to eat their lunch, 
that, uh, earlier uh, on Thursday. They were going to eat their lunch and they couldn't because it was froze. They couldn't even get the lunch. And they, so they had nothing, no water, no nothing. So by then, it was starting to affect their minds. So they decided what they're going to do. They're going to put the, the little kids on the floor, take their coats, put it on the floor. Then the bigger kids would lay on top of them and cover up. But meanwhile, Mr. Unteed and Mr. Thornberg had had lifted just enough where they got to, they could see. And they spotted the school bus. So they took off. The way the kids were just getting ready to pile on top of them, they get warm. And so they that door slung open. And Mr. Unteed stuck his head and said, oh my God, what a sight. But anyway, they, they got the kids in the wagon, and all the time, they're doing nothing on the map right here. Here's the bus. And right here, it's only half a mile from the bus. Just a half a mile. So they took the kids to the Ryder family, and they just Mr. and Mrs. Ryder, and uh, got them in there. And this picture here shows some of the kids. They were seated, they put them on the floor. But they no more than got the kids in there. And Mr. Miller's daughter, <coughs> they said they thought she would have already, because she was in a coma when they picked them up. But she had passed, she passed away by the time they got there. The little auntie boy, <coughs> it, it said his dad, what they was doing, they were rubbing them. And they were rubbing snow on, on the frostbite and kerosene, which that was the wrong thing to do. That's what they said. But it must have done some good because nobody lost their arm or leg out there. But anyway, Mr. Hunting was rubbing his son legs and trying to get the blood circulation. Right after they got him there, they, they gave him a shot, give each one of the kids a teaspoonful of whiskey. And to get the blood thinned up, we'll get whatever. And Mrs. Ryder, she starts frying some potatoes. We got something for him to eat. <coughs> what Mr. Hunter was working on, his son, he was working right now. He said, I'm going to, told his son, he said, I'm going to go and help the son of the kid up next to you. So he was over there and he turned around and looked, and his son had passed away. So that made the five kids. That, that lost their life in there. So when they got there, Mr. Reiner, and in the area, they had a phone. And the phone line was just one line, one wire, running on top of the fence post. And there's the wind blowing, it's a piece of much stack, and you never know if it's going to work or not. But, uh, Mr. Stonebreaker, he happened to be one that had to have a phone. So Mr. Reiner, uh, Reiner told his nephew, you head over there and you get on that phone and you get to call for help. And nothing's happened. He got through on that line and got to hold the operator in town. And uh, we got them and then the word got out all over. The word got back into Holly. The doctor and five um, five men took their cars, hooked them together, pulled them to push and pull, and took that and took that doctor up there. And they they broke the, the uh, trail for him to get up there. But anyway, he got there. Then another doctor came in from Tribune, and uh, of course they wouldn't let him sleep. Would have still wouldn't let him go to sleep because you know, like that's all they do. They, they would just, he wouldn't ever wake up. But they spent the night there that way. But anyway, the word had got into Lamar and Mr. Charles Maxwell, the gentleman that built Maxwell Hospital. He got a hold of a guy by the name of Jack Hart. He had an airplane. 
And they, they said that Jack Hart picked up two nurses and flew them down there. Meanwhile, the gentleman that owned the Denver Post, he had some uh, uh, men out on, on, another, on another route, running another error. But anyway, they got eight cold, got a hold of them and sent them back. And, excuse me, let me back. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> But when Mr. Auntie uh, and Mr. Uh, spotted that bus, this is the site. That they seen. They were right in this area and they spotted that bus right there. Now what had happened, see when he left school, he went up here and he thought he's taking this room, but he made another right turn back. Round and round in this here. But anyway, like I said before, you know, on the storm, that storm, the snow, it didn't really pile up, it, it drifted. But anyway, the airplane from Denver Post came in, he landed in this field, and Mr. Hart, Jack Hart, he landed in that field, same place. So meanwhile, they took the, this picture over, I don't think I got one, yeah, right here, excuse me. They're, they're loading them on one plane. Now some of the photographers and, and newspapers, they wanted a, a picture of the hero. So they had named somebody a hero, so they named it this, this auntie boy the hero. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't as bad. It was, it was a little worse, but anyway, they went ahead and sent him in a car into Holly. But anyway, they brought out another boy, wrapped up, Right here, see right had blank. And they said that was the auntie's boy. Well, it didn't make no difference with newspaper people as long as they had a picture. That's all they get, that, whatever. But anyway, Mr. Reiner's son, I got to visit with him before he passed away. And, uh, and he told me a lot of stories that his dad had told him. And he was telling me about this incident here that Mr. Reiner told him. But anyway, next morning they took the, uh, well before that they took the, the other two that passed away, put them away. But anyway, next morning they went to search for the bus driver. They searched all morning long, all the way around the bus where the bus happened. and. Uh, All this area, they searched, they couldn't find nothing. So long about four or five o'clock that afternoon, Ralph Lucius, which lived all down in here, he told him, he says, uh, well, I've got chores to do, I've, I've got to go home. He said, but I'll, on the way home, I'll, I'll keep my eye open. Ralph got down here about three and a half miles from here down in this area here. And something caught his eye off to the east, about half a mile. All in all, it must be a coyote or an animal or something that died, whatever. Or it might be a soapweed, whatever. But anyway, I'm going to check it out. So he got out of his car and he walked out. And there lied Mr. Miller. Right along this fence. Never did. He got Thought he was warm enough. He'd had his coat wide open. His hands were just nothing but cut full of blood. So he wanted to have his hand running down that fence line. But he hadn't got down there, and this is as far as he got. Anyway, they got there, all the kids, took my plane to Tobin Lamar to the National Hospital. And the rest of them, they took them in the hallway for time being. 
Then later on, they took them on into the war to the hospital. But uh, they took the ones that passed away. They took them in uh, into Holly. And this is this is another story that got kind of fumbled around. I read several places that they took the kids to Lamar and they used Lamar Armory for the morning. And they had the funerals up there. But that is not right. That is not right. They took the kids in Holly and they used the Holly Armory for the morgue. And the funeral, they buried them in the Holly Cemetery, which over here you can see. This is your monument. And this is the plaque, the monument that is just where the bus has to happen. And this is a monument from the kids afterwards. But uh, Clara said in her deal, she said, Mr. Maxwell never charged them one penny for the care that they got us to the hospital. Not one penny. And uh, I got, of course, the hair split the bus. This is the bus. In 1936, after this is what it changed to. It had changed to whether bright yellow. Now this, I just put this in just, just with kickers. Now this is a, a bus analogy. Now that same thing could happen today. I don't care how many radios, what you got, it could happen. And you could have a site like that analogy. And it, like, chances will never happen, but one out of ten, it can happen. Like they said this here, this would never happen. But, but this was a, it was a wake up call all over the country, everywhere. It was a wake up call. By 1939, after the district mayor and the government state never got through, they had changed the standards, 44 standards, on the school buses and in the school. Whatever. So, and, uh, but like I say, this is your school, there's nothing but just a plastic school, whatever, so. But, uh, at Fort Wilk, I think, I know I missed some things, but I don't care what happened, but nobody will never know exactly just what happened inside that bus. Now, outside, yeah, you know, this or that, everything, this and that. But inside that bus, and those kids, and you take little kids, you know, six, seven, eight years, that cold, mine, they had no idea what room in their mind was just gone. And just like Romer said, you know, just, uh, what she can remember was very little. But there were some things did stick to her mind. But you take all the years like that. And another thing, she said, it wasn't only her, but the rest of them. Not a one of them would talk about it. Not a one of them would even talk to their family about it. And Rosemary Mary's children said, she never did until later years that she said anything to her kids. And they were, now why was it where, I don't know. But the family was the same way. Nobody wanted to talk about it. But uh, in this in this area, everybody was neighbors. If once somebody was sick, <coughs> the neighbor they got help. It was it was tight tight. And on the bus, the kids was, was got to talk. With, some of us got to talk about. Now, mom was making bread today. Today's her bread day. Oh, they one was wash day. And just things like that, you know, I'm talking about. And one little kid, she said, well, what for supper? Well, we have uh, cornbread and beans every night of the week for supper. Mm -hmm. So, it, and people, it was hard, hard up. 